if you've been on a healing journey, gained some momentum, and are now currently in a slump, but you so desperately want your momentum back so you can keep intentionally healing, I have an online mini course designed specifically for you. Visit humanamplified.com front slash momentum restored course to learn more. I'm your host, Brandi Fleck, and this is Human Amplified. We're on a mission to revamp society by amplifying your humanity. This week on the show. Hi, I'm Dr. John Martini, and I am based out of Houston, Texas. At least I have an office there. Trauma has nothing to do with what happens to you. Trauma is a choice of perception. Anything that you have that's imbalanced in your mind is going to keep dominating your mind until you bring it to balance. I label things events and they're neutral, and then I help people see the other side and balance it out so they can be grateful. There's something to love in anybody if you look. And when you know how to ask the question, where's the other side of the contrast, the story changes. Today, we're talking to Dr. John Demartini. He's a human behavior expert, educator, international best-selling author, and founder of the Demartini Institute. And get this, he's a man who was born on Thanksgiving Day, and he now works in gratitude to transform lives. Dr. John Demartini is a returning guest to Human Amplified. He was featured on the blog this past summer for a more foundational understanding of the gratitude topics discussed in today's podcast episode. You may find it helpful to read his blog interview titled On the Way, Not in the Way. Today, however, we get straight to the point in answering the question, how can you love every experience you've had in life, even when you've experienced trauma? Dr. Demartini immediately and vividly details examples of how this is possible and what his unidentified clients have done to implement his advice in their specific difficult scenarios. The answers involve big mindset shifts, understanding how deep gratitude works, and then being able to find gratitude in all of life, regardless of if you deem the experience to be, in Dr. Demartini's words, terrible or terrific. Dr. Demartini's gratitude work seems to be taking people out of a victim mentality. In this episode, we discuss topics like perception, the impact of becoming aware of the unconscious, why you may not see the benefit of a trauma, the benefits of gratitude, Dr. Demartini's own personal gratitude journaling practice that he's had for over 39 years, and cultural feelings around death. You'll leave this episode with inspiration and empowerment. Specifically, you'll get a lot of food for thought, actionable advice to explore your own perceptions around past trauma you've experienced, and tips for finding gratitude to help you move forward and rewrite your story. This episode does come with a trigger warning. Real stories of healing from violent abductions and rape are discussed in detail. Listener discretion is advised. For the links mentioned throughout this episode, visit humanamplified.com front slash episodes front slash 095. Today on the show, I would love to welcome back Dr. John Demartini. He was on the blog earlier this year, and now he's back. And we're going to, to dive even deeper into gratitude. Welcome back, Dr. Demartini. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. For the listeners who have not familiarized themselves with your article on our site, can you just introduce yourself, tell them who you are and what you do? Well, I'm John Demartini, Dr. John Demartini. I am involved in human behavior. I've been an educator for 49 plus years, and I research, write, travel, and teach. I love it. And anything to do with maximizing human awareness and potential and then helping people evolve their objectives in life to create what the life that they would really love to do. I love helping people do that. And that's sort of what I do every day. I, I'm researching, writing, traveling, and teaching, doing that every day, seven days a week. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And that's amazing. So right now I do want to invite our guests to go. If you guys haven't read the interview that he had with us earlier, it's on the blog. It's called On the Way, Not in the Way. The link to that will be in the show notes. But let's just dive right in. When you came on the show in the fall, 
you said several times, there's nothing the mortal body can experience that the mortal soul can't love. And I really love that. I think it's been really helpful for some folks. Can you break this down for us, though, for, say, specifically people who have been through abuse and trauma? How does this statement apply? Well, there's no such thing as abuse and trauma until you decide to call it that. Mm. It's just an event in your life. You can choose to make a mountain out of a molehill, a mole out of a mountain, a heaven out of a hell, a hell out of a heaven. You can choose to see the downsides or the upsides and make it terrific or terrible. And that's the thing that makes us distinct is we don't let the external, we don't have to let the external world run our lives. We can change our perception, change our decision and change our actions around things. And William James said the greatest discovery of his generations that human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions and attitudes of mind. Could I share a story that might be very helpful in this uh, arena? Absolutely. I have had the opportunity to work with people who have been through pretty amazing labeled traumas. Okay. People okay. blown up in their hands uh, in military things to um, rape cases, to beatings, to, I mean, I've seen amazing stuff. But recently I had a client that was contacting, contacted me that was kidnapped. Oh, wow. And he was driving down the highway and four cars pull up around him, stopped the traffic, knocked out his windows, opened the doors, grabbed him, put a sack over his head, stuck in the back of a, uh, of a vehicle and one of the vehicles and then drove off. And for five and a half hours, he was in the back of the vehicle, then taken to a place and then a ransom was set and millions of dollars had to be transferred in order to, to be able to see his family again and to live. Yeah. And it was quite an interesting thing when he, when I first got on with him, you know, he was running the story, the typical story. This is a trauma. I've been traumatized. I can't sleep. I'm, it's hard to get out of my head. Da, 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 I'm running this thing, et cetera. And I said, okay, stop. And I asked him a simple question. Go to the moment when you actually remember the windows being crashed in and you're now taken, et cetera. Let's go in there and you're, you're now in the boot of the car or whatever. I said, what's the benefit of that? He said, well, there is no benefit to that. I said, if you see no benefit to that, you're going to be traumatized. You're going to label it something terrible and you're going to be stuck in that model for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of that? He said, I can't see any. I said, if you can't see any, it means you chose not to look because you said that within about half a second, which means you didn't even try to look. Look again. What's the benefit of that? I, how could there be a benefit? I, 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 I'm not <laughs> interested in that. You've got this, this moral idea that that's absolute evil. And there's no relative benefits to it. So look again. And he stopped and he looked. And then all of a sudden he got a little teary eyed and he said, it brought me incredibly close to my family, which I've never experienced before. Hmm. Great. What's another benefit? I'm now really present with my kids, which is sort of the same thing. I said, that means you're really engaged with them. He says, while I was in the boot, the only thing I could see in my face, in my mind is my family. And I was taking them for granted. And right now, they're the absolute top of the list. I said, great. What's another benefit? Well, because I was hidden for five and a half, almost six weeks, my business had to rise occasion. And all the people that I was hoping to rise up and be leaders, they all took it over. And my business is more profitable now since I'm out of it and only kind of sidearms instead of in it every day, trying to control everything. So I've now freed up my system and I'm able to now not have to be there. And my business is flourishing where it's actually more profitable than it was. And I was in its way and I didn't realize that. I said, great, what's the benefit of that? Well, I'm now able to be able to, I've had a vacation with my family. I'm closer to my wife, my, my father. We weren't even talking. Mm -hmm. And my father's now close mm -hmm. to me again. And my mom's close to me again. And they're helping in the family. And it's a, they weren't even really acknowledging the family. And I just kept going through this. What's another benefit? How did it help you socially? I found out who really cared. I found out who was really priority to spend time with. And how did it help you financially? It says, I'm making more money now, working more efficient and hardly working and just overseeing. I said, is, did you have a goal to do that? He says, I have been sitting there with anxiety knowing that I was walking on eggshells in a sense with my family dynamic and probably on the verge of a potential divorce because my wife was wanting me around more and I wasn't doing it and I was ignoring it and cocky and 
and arrogant and and I've been humbled and I'm now close and I'm more, it's a level field. We actually have a relationship today. And I did have an anxiety about what would happen if we divorce and the economics of that and the cost of that and, and all that's gone. Mm -hmm. I said, so did you, and he, and he said this and he got teary eyed and he said, I actually did a prayer, right? He's got a religious background. He said, I did a prayer. How do I solve this situation? Four days before this guy came and these, these four men came. Oh, wow. So did these four men actually fulfill two basic prayers, how to get people in your company to rise into power and so you could be free to do things and also be close to your family? And he got teary eyed and he just said, he says, I feel like I want to thank him right now. I said, keep going. What's another benefit? I made him go around the wheel of life spiritually. How did it help you mentally? How did it help you health wise? He said, health wise, since this has occurred, the first thing I wanted to do, I, well, I first lost weight, which I've been trying to do. That's done. That was another benefit. But I'm now are doing meditation. I'm now eating differently. My wife is now making sure I'm eating differently. Well, I was always on a hurry and I was eating just quick stuff and I wasn't paying attention to my health. I'm now conscious of that. And I'm now listening to my kids. I'm now finding out what they're doing. I've actually been to their school and I've watched them in functions. And he just started bawling. He said, these are dreams that I had that came true because of these guys. They were the catalyst. And I went on through this and he just bawled with gratitude. Mm. I said, trauma has nothing to do with what happens to you. Trauma is a choice of perception and an unwilling to look for the unconscious information that is always present that you haven't looked for. And your mind will automatically in a freeze response, dissociate from what you think is trauma and create a fantasy and an ecstatic fantasy to compensate for it in order to maintain homeostasis in the brain. Your brain will always have a pair of opposites. And if you can ask the question and make yourself conscious of what was unconscious and be fully conscious, you will realize that the traumas are not traumas. They're experiences that are on the way, not in the way until you choose to distort them with some sort of subjective bias and moral hypocrisy. Mm. And when he got through, in two hours, we cleared this thing. Months of so-called therapy. Two hours to clear. Nobody ever asked him what were the upsides and benefits. They just let him run his story of his trauma. Mm. And I said, so what's the benefits? And he just got up to the point where he was in tears of gratitude. He went home and he shared all those benefits with the family and had them in their arms around each other and thanked them. And they said, these are the benefits. We've got our dad back. And they all cried together. It was a thing. It just is over with. The so-called trauma to the family was over with, and there was a thank, a thank you energy. All right. And realizing that they actually right. felt like there was some sort of a divine intervention going on because there the wishes of all the people in the family were all met by these four men. Yeah. And you think, yeah. well, that's a bizarre way of looking at life. No, it isn't. It's a smart way to look at life because then you realize that no matter what happens in your life, you can be grateful. Anything you're not grateful for in your life is baggage. Anything you are grateful for is fuel. He's fueled now by the experience. And now it doesn't have to linger in his mind with a post-traumatic stress disordered label that's preoccupying your mind. Because anything that you have that's imbalanced in your mind is going to keep dominating your mind until you bring it to balance. When people want to run their story and be victims of history, I stop them. I said, if you, if you run that story, you're going to stay stuck. I'm going to hit them with reality and ask them some questions that they haven't been asking and help them see things they haven't been seeing. And when they're done, they're going to say, thank you. Okay. Because the more challenging thing you've been through, the more, more inspired you could be if you balanced it out. Yeah. And when you realize yeah. that I had a lady that was raped by 100 men by a motorcycle gang tied to a block in New Zealand in four hours in front of a television crew, we worked until all of that was tears of gratitude. And the moment she did that, she freed up her voice because her voice was raspy and sounded like a male. It sounded like a Wolfman Jack kind of a sound mm -hmm. uh, because of the screaming. And she was dressed in a little girl's outfit because she never got past that, which is a, and a kind of a remembrance system of the thing. Yeah. And she freed that up. Yeah. She's now empowering people, best-selling author, and is married to a man that has tattoos that look like the leader and has no fear anymore. And she says, one of the greatest things that happened is I don't walk around with fear. Most people live in anxieties and constantly avoiding things and stuff like that. I'm now, if I, if I could transform that situation into something to be grateful for 
and found out people love me no matter what, which the man is now in my life who loves me no matter what. I told him what happened and he just loved me. Mm-hmm. He said, that's worth, mm-hmm. that's worth it. And that's how to perceive life, to, to sit there like, like Victor Frankl in the concentration camps. You sit there and you can sit and become wallowing pity party or in trauma drama, or you can sit down and turn it into something to be meaningful. Yeah. And to be able to extract yeah. meaning out of existence is what differentiates us from the animals. The animals have an impulse towards things in an instinct away, but they can't neutralize us with an intuitive, meaningful extractor and see the hidden order in their apparent chaos. So I don't label things terrific or ter- terrible. I label things events that are neutral. And then I help people see the other side and balance it out so they can be grateful. Yeah, that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing those stories, because I think that'll help a lot of people. I just want to dig a little deeper into this, because I know there are probably a lot of people who would not be able to see the benefit of something that they label as trauma. So they're, they're, cho- no, they're choosing to say they're not able to. OK, is not true. OK, to say that they're, they're getting still more advantage and disadvantage by not. OK, because when we have an advantage, more advantages and disadvantages, by not seeing it, we don't see it. I've seen that sometimes in government supported post traumatic stress conditions. They get so many benefits, and in the agenda from not getting it resolved, that they, that, that they will stay with that because they're getting too many benefits. If all of a sudden that trauma was taken away and they have to go back to work, they think that that's more difficulty than what they've got right now. So they'll pr- avoid that answer. Okay. As long as there's more advantage and disadvantages staying in that that story, they're going to keep that story. Mm, Okay. Unless somebody like me knows how to ask the questions to help them see a different perspective. Gotcha. All right. And so you're just going to keep asking the questions. What's the benefit until the benefits, they see how the benefits outweigh. Yeah. And you can also do it in reverse. What's the drawback if this hadn't happened? (laughs) Well, he would, he, he, he felt that he would have been divorced. Mm -hmm. It would have cost him half of his fortune. Yeah. I said, would you rather give up uh, $10 million or $60 million? What do you? What would you prefer? <laughs> he goes, 10. I said, I paid that much in consulting fees, but I didn't get the same results. This, gave me, this guy gave me real results for a $10 million consulting fee. Yeah, okay. Well, I hope he wouldn't want to lose his wife, too. I mean, that would be sad. He was headed towards a situation that would have led him to divorce and not seeing his kids, and then running himself ragged and his health down. He, he saw what was going down. Yeah. Once, it, once this happened, okay. he couldn't see it beforehand or he didn't want to listen to what his body and physiology and psychology was saying to him. Yeah. Okay. Let's shift into the types of gratitude. So, well, you talked about last time we talked, you talked about what happens when distress is transformed into you stress. And since we have that foundation of a definition already, Can you tell us what some of the day-to-day tangible benefits of practicing gratitude in this way are? Well, there's a superficial gratitude and a deep gratitude. The deep gratitude I sometimes call grace, just to differentiate it. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you look nice, or gives you a nice little gift or something, and you say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, that's easy. Any amygdala-based individual uh, can do that. When something supports your values, thank you. When something challenges your values, you have a completely different word for that, but still it ends up with you. <laughs> but, but when something goes and challenges you and you can reframe that and see the other side to it, become conscious of the upsides to it and see a gratitude for the things that challenge you, you have a deeper gratitude. Because it's easy to be grateful when things go in your way. It's when you're not seemingly going your way Mm-hmm. that actually in a hidden way is going your way, but you can't see it. That form of gratitude is more profound and more in depth. And that's the one that requires looking and discovering unconscious information that you're overlooking. And that gratitude, once you bring things into balance, brings homeostasis to the body. It helps us wake up our executive center, which governs impulses and instincts and makes us more poised and present and productive. It helps us have less noise in the brain. It helps us in having more equanimity within ourselves and equity between others, which is a sustainable fair exchange position in business 
for growing business that grows wealth and helps grow wealth because until you can manage emotions, don't expect to manage money. And if you can manage your emotions and take whatever happens to you and balance it, you're in command. It helps relationships because when you're cocky and self-righteous looking down on people, wanting them to live in your values, it doesn't work. And you're minimizing yourself and walking on eggshells, it doesn't work for you. But when you're actually in level balanced state and you're grateful for the individual, people want to be loved and appreciated for who they are. If you're grateful for them and you love them for who they are, you are going to have a much more profound relationship. Mm. In leadership roles, anybody who can do that has a high EQ and as well as IQ, because they're they're able to take in an abstraction of perception, not, not just be stuck with phenomenological sensory data, but they're able to conceptualize abstractions and see both sides of things, which is a higher IQ. And EQ is to be able to manage your emotions. And physiologically, when you do that, you are literally bringing autonomic balance, epigenetic balance, and changing physiology to maximize human resilience and adaptation, and your heart rate variability goes up. And spiritually, what is spirituality but grace? You know, human will not having to change you relative to others or others relative to you because you see the order of it. Mm-hmm. And you're now in a state of thank you as it is. It's, it's, we're disgraced when we're trying to fix the universe. We're graced when we realize the way the universe is at this moment, I wouldn't change. Thank you. So, I, I mean, every area of life is impacted by gratitude and, and asking quality questions that make you fully conscious. Full consciousness is seeing the hidden order in the apparent chaos. And partial consciousness or subjective bias is when you are polarizing and dramatizing the misperceptions. And then running your racket story about how it's, you know, something that's caused you pleasure or pain instead of an event that's neutral that you chose to bias your interpretation. When you're infatuated with somebody, you're, you're conscious, the upside, unconscious, the bad downside. You have a subjective bias towards the positives and you have a confirm, confirm, disconfirmation bias on the negatives. That's your reality. And then you, your intuition is trying to whisper, hey, that person you're infatuated has got downsides, but you're ignoring it at that moment. And that ignorance is what's getting you polarized into these emotional states. Same thing for when you resent somebody. There's nobody worth putting on pedestals or in pits. There's something to love in anybody if you look. And I've gotten to work in prisons, the maximum security prisons. And I tell you, I've, I've seen people transform their lives by realizing that there's, there was a hidden order in their life after all. People just don't take the time to look. Okay. I could go, I could tell you a story on that one. That's a mind blower too. It's a tearjerker. I would love to hear it, please. So I was asked to speak at Krugersdorp prison, maximum security prison in, in Johannesburg, in Krugersdorp. And uh, I spoke to the warden in, in about 400 of the faculties and teams and people there first. And then they took me three stories underground, literally down a ramp, three stories underground, where there's no windows or anything. It's just down underneath. So the maximum security area. And there we went into a holding cell. We had the Alta Jira television crew there. They were filming the whole thing. I had my publicist, my director, the warden, and six guards, and another man. And we went in this holding cell, and they had to lock behind us, and they had to open up the main entrance into the main holding area for the, where all the prisoners are. And there was 1,000 prisoners, orange uniforms. So I had to walk and I was led with three guards on either side of me. And we had to walk through the center and go right into the center of the room. And I had to stand on this plastic stool kind of thing upside down. It's facing where I'm standing on top of it. And the film crew is around there and they're kind of anxious because they're right in the middle of all this, these people. But we're surrounded by these guards. And I start to speak and I ask people, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life, how many of you deep inside have a desire to want to make a difference in the world? Every hand went up in a billionth of a second. 100% of that room went up, which was mind blowing to most people wouldn't believe that would be the case, but that's what was there. And as I was speaking for the next 15 minutes, all of a sudden I got a heckler. And the guy said, you know, that's easy for you. You know, that's easy for you, but what happened? You had no mama, no data. Yeah, yeah, it's easy for you, man. You know, and he, and he started giving this hard this thing. And for some reason, just without thinking, 
I stepped off the stool and walked towards him. Now, that's something they told me not to do. Do not walk amongst the group because they can grab you and try to escape that way. But I didn't. It was a spontaneous just doing. I just started walking over this guy and the, the guards are trying to keep up with me. And I'm walking firmly towards us and people are moving out of the way. And I get right in front of this guy. And I said to him, and it was, I had the microphone. And I said, I said, nothing's missing in your life. When you didn't have a mama, somebody else played those roles in a mama. If you look really carefully, somebody else stepped up to play that role. Well, you took on a piece. Your father took on a piece. A friend took on a piece. A gang leader took on a piece. A mother of a friend took on a piece. If you made a list of everything you thought you missed out and look at who took it on, you will find out that nothing is missing. It's in a form. And if you look really carefully, you can find the benefits of that form and then the drawbacks if your mom had done it. Because if you compare your current reality to a fantasy of how it should have been, you'll never appreciate your life and now make you angry and bitter and you'll think the world's against you. Yeah. And I just kind of went into yeah. it and he just listened because I was so firm with him and so certain about it. He just listened. And all of a sudden a yelling, howling cry comes from two thirds of the way across the room. Bawling. A man starts bawling. And when I heard it, again, a spontaneous approach, I started heading to where this guy was. And everybody got out of the way. They just let me come through this thing to get to this guy. And this guy's bawling, just bawling. And the warden's trying to keep up with me. And the guards are trying to keep up with me because I walk fast. And I just had plowed through this thing and didn't really focus. It was when, you, when you're doing that, they're not interested in, in attacking. You're trying to help them. Yeah. Right. They could sense it. Yeah. And so I went right over to this guy and this guy's bawling. He's a big, tall guy, probably six, three or something like that. He's just bawling and crying. And finally, the warden and the, the team's right there. And, and this guy says, I know who my mama is. I know who my mama is. I had a mama all this time. And he had been 26 years in prison for a life sentence. And he points to the warden. He says, and she's a short little lady. He says, you are my mama. You have been my mama for 26 years. I've had a mama this whole time. If it wasn't for you, mama, I would be dead. You kept me from killing myself. You kept me from all those drugs. You have been making sure I've been fed and I've been clothed. and You've been my mama. The warden is bawling. The men are crying. That room had no dry eyes in that room. I mean, it was just tear jerking. Mm. Bawling was going all over that room. People realizing that nothing was missing. Mm. That guy that Hector was sitting there hugging another guy, realizing that everybody was authentic. Nobody was in fear. The warden, the... The, the, the guards, none of them, they were all not on defense. They were just present. And there was a healing in that day. And 10 years later, I went back to that prison to speak again. And some of those guys were still there and still remembered me and I remembered them. And they asked if they could take a picture of me because it changed their life. And the warden said, yes, get a picture. You changed these people's lives last time. So it has nothing to do with what you've been through or going through. What matters is how you perceive from this moment forward. Yeah. They change yeah. their perception and change their story. The story is a racket we run when it's emotional, when, when we are choosing not to see the whole. We're seeing parts, but not the whole. Gotcha. And the unconscious part, when it's brought up and you're fully conscious, there's going to be grace. There's going to be a gratitude level that's deep. Yeah. And that's yeah. what these men experienced. So I don't, when somebody comes to me and says, well, I've been traumatized. I said, okay. I had a lady in, in London, a 15 year old girl standing on the street corner with a guy that she had to crush on. who's a taller guy with a few friends and they were doing what some teeners do. They're smoking pot and they're getting high and they're, you know, having some liquor or whatever with some wine or whatever they're drinking. And all of a sudden, a car pulls up. They're right on the edge of the sidewalk. And, and uh, the car pulls up and asks if they could come to the car and get instructions. 
And when the girl goes over there to try to give him instructions on where something was, they grabbed her into the car and pulled her down. We're trying to get her in a car to steal her away or rape her. I don't know what was going to happen. And the guy that she fantasized that she could be with rescued her and grabbed her and fought with them and pulled her out and back onto the thing. And she got bruised a bit, but they drove off finally. And then that moment in her state of mind, she was, quote, traumatized. That's what they labeled it. And so now she's not able to sleep. She's having panic attacks. She's now being put on medication. She's now been given a title and a label and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So what I did, somebody has told the mother to bring her to me. And I sat in the, one of the hotels there and with, with the mother and her. I said, go to the moment. And I took frame by frame by frame. This whole thing was less than four minutes. I took each frame in her perception for four minutes and took each frame and looked at where her mind created the opposite. So I said, at that exact moment, they're pulling you down into the car. Who's trying to lift you up away from the car? The guy that I dreamed about, the boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So that means you were being pulled down and lifted up. Yes. And who is trying to hurt you? And who is trying to keep you from being hurt? And who was... Uh, forcing you to do something you didn't want to do and who was doing something you wanted to do. And I just took the pairs of opposites because our mind deals with sequential and or simultaneous contrast. When you have sequential contrast, you store that in a subconscious mind and you end up with all kinds of polarized perceptions and motions. When you have simultaneous pair of contrast, you liberate yourself into a super conscious state, a mindful state. And all of a sudden you realize there's nothing there except something to be thankful for. So I went through and took every one of those frames in that four minute segment and found out frame by frame by frame, every one of the opposite things that went on. And the moment we did from somebody, you know, trying to constrain me, somebody set me free, all of the pairs of opposites, we went and balanced them all out. They were all there. And I've done this, God knows how many hundreds of times, thousands of times. Mm -hmm. It's always there. And people don't believe it, but you can't even perceive without perceiving contrast. That's how perceptions are. And when you know how to ask the question, where's the other side of the contrast, the story changes. So I went through that. It took two hours to go through that entire thing. And when we got through, we, I think, what's the benefit of this? She got her boyfriend. And who came home with her? Who went to the hospital with her? Who has been her boyfriend ever since? I said, you got what you wanted. And if this hadn't happened, would you have gotten it? And so, so I don't know. I wouldn't have had the courage to speak up. So do these people help you actually get what you wanted, the boyfriend that you dreamed of? Yes. Hmm. Did you get closer to your mother and you were alienating your mother and your father and they now closer to you? Yes. I'm now able to say anything without them judging it. I said, what's that worth? She says, she had tears in her eyes. She said, what can I say? I got what I, I, I had the very things that I was hoping for came about because of those people. Mm -hmm. And I said, somehow there's, there's the, the, the universe works in mysterious ways to help us become authentic and live by what's deeply meaningful to us and what's unconsciously wanting to be expressed. Mm -hmm. And wisdom is seeing that. Anyway, we finished that. And I said, now try to become panic, try to create a panic attack. She couldn't come up with it. So I gave her a big hug and I said, thank you. Great job. You did a great job. Her mother was just going, that's it? I said, that's it? <laughs> She's not going to have any more panic attacks? No. Stop the frigging medication. Tell that guy to go put it up his butt. Yeah. Labeling people and putting them on psychiatric drugs sometimes is useful in some cases, but not always needed if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I spoke, that was on a Friday I did a presentation, the Breakthrough Experience on the weekend, which is my signature program. And then on Tuesday, if Monday I filmed, Tuesday I did a pre evening pro presentation in London. Front row, there was the mother and the daughter. And I didn't see them at first. And then I looked down and there they were. And I came off the stage and I gave them both a hug. I said, so how are we doing? They put both their thumbs up. Not one panic attack. I've slept like a baby. I don't have any issues. Thank you. I can't believe that, that it's over with. That's awesome. So don't put a label on things and say that it's an event out there. Take command of your life because people that are extrinsically oriented become victims of history. People that are intrinsically accountable for perceptions 
and can realize that whatever is going on the outside, there's a new interpretation of it, they can become extremely resourceful and completely transform their perceptions. Yeah. Why not ask the right question? Quality of our life is basically quite the questions. Are. We are not asking the right questions if we're going to label things trauma. And I'm certain, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. And people say, well, but what about, what about running your story is going to keep you stuck for the rest of your life. But transforming the story is going to liberate you and, and, and exemplify what's possible as a human being with resilience and adaptability. Yeah. Becoming unstuck is really important. I mean, so I think, I think you've given us a lot of examples of how to do that and talking about the opposites and perception and all of those things. So thank you for that. Listeners, we're talking to human behavior expert, educator, international best-selling author, and founder of the Demartini Institute, Dr. John Demartini. It's time for a quick break. I'm your host, Brandy Fleck, and this is Human Amplified. Feeling stuck and like you've lost steam in your healing process? I've been there too. And if you're anything like me, you're probably being too hard on yourself. You're saying things like, I can't stay motivated. I'm on edge and anxious. And I never have the time. What if I told you that practices and emotions that help you stay motivated are within reach? We can find out what drives you so you can get moving in the right direction again. What if I told you that relaxing and playing are as essential to your well-being as air, food, and water? Relaxation and play can be priorities in your life that you don't have to feel bad about. And they also help decrease the unease you feel. And what if I told you that growing or even starting a spiritual but not religious practice actually creates more time in your life to focus on the things that keep you going? It's hard to imagine how adding something to your to-do list could free up your time, but that's exactly what happens when you embrace the universe. You become more aligned with who you're meant to be, and that alignment creates momentum. Imagine what it would feel like to wake up in a world full of chaos and have hope that things will get better. Imagine what it would feel like to be calm and grounded without worrying about the overwhelm. And imagine what it would feel like to be confident the other shoe isn't going to drop. It's possible. I tell you exactly how to achieve these desired outcomes in the online mini course, Momentum Restored. It's a step-by-step system to give you tools to stay committed to the healing process and make progress even when it's hard. Visit humanamplified.com front slash momentum restored course to enroll today. Now back to our discussion with human behavior expert, educator, and best-selling author, Dr. John Demartini. I would like to sort of get to know a little bit more about you for a second Does doing these events, like when you were in that prison and these things were happening, is there also a healing for you that goes on? I I don't know. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to watch lives transform. Okay. You know, that was, that means a lot to me. I don't care what the issue is. I can't say that all those issues are ones that I've experienced personally. Yeah. Um, But, and so I don't know if it's a healing as much as it's an inspiration. Mm, and okay. it's and it's a confirmation uh, because I don't I don't feel like I'm having to heal from to do that I I feel grateful for the opportunity to watch lives change I get to yeah. watch it every day mm-hmm. I mean I do this seven days a week and okay. so yeah it's 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 a dream come true because I had a dream you know when I was a, a teenager to travel the world and research and write and teach and help people transform their lives somebody helped me doing that at one time. And, and I made a commitment in my mind that, you know, when I'm his age, someday I'm going to be doing the same thing. And, and I'm not at that age. I'm 67. This guy was, you know, eighties, almost nineties. So I figured I got another 20, 30 years. And maybe when I'm that age, I want to pass the torch to another 17 year old, like he did to me. Mm-hmm. So, but so it's meaningful and inspiring and something to be grateful for. And I, and that is healing to any physiology. But it's not a healing of a specific event because there's thousands of different issues and it's not, I don't have those experiences. I have never been kidnapped per se. You know, I had fantasies of a girl that I liked kidnapping me, but it never worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. 
So let's let's pivot into gratitude journaling for a moment. Um, how long have you been gratitude journaling? Uh, really, really formally about 30, almost nine years. Okay. But before that, it was it was not as structured and not as consistent. Okay. The, the moment we started having a IBM Selectric typewriter with a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A erasable ball on the top yeah. where I could type it. And the first handy computer came out. It's when it became formalized for me. Then transferred that from floppy disk into finally the new drives and eventually onto things. And it's been with me ever since. And it's now 30 volumes. And some of those volumes are 900 pages. So oh, there's wow. thousands wow. and thousands of pages of gratitude. Thousands. Yeah. Can you describe for us what exactly gratitude journaling is? And is it a tool that can help someone change their perspective? Well, it, what it does, I was told when I was 23 by a gentleman who had six PhDs. He was 35 years old. It was one of the brightest men I ever met. He said, don't ever go to bed at night until you reviewed your day. And anything in the day you can't say thank you for, review again and look deeper until you can find the order to it and then be grateful for it. So at 23, um, I did that. So I was already doing gratitude processes. I was born on Thanksgiving Day. My mom, when I was four, told me to count my blessings uh -huh. because of those that are grateful for what they got, they get more to be grateful for. So it's it's been in my, in my system all that time. And it was written down on little pieces of paper uh, up until the time I put it on the IBM in the dot matrix, but it got formalized then. And so, yeah, what I write down today, it's got more standardized. And what I've done now is I had the opportunity. I just ended, started that way, had the opportunity to dot, 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 had the opportunity to meet this individual, had the opportunity to go in this place, had this opportunity to listen to this lecture, had the opportunity to go to dinner with this individual, had the opportunity to uh, be challenged and criticized and look back and refine my procedures, uh, had the opportunity to travel uh, around the world and happen to stop in this port or something because I, you know, I live on a ship. So had the opportunity. I, I usually started out that way. And that gives me some structure. And then there may be other spontaneous things. And much of my gratitudes today are letters of thanks from my students. Mm, okay. Uh, today, I got a notice that one of my students just died and he had a heart to give out on him. And so the gratitude was that having the opportunity to know this individual and learn from this individual and share with this individual. Um, and, and I tried to reach his wife, but she's probably too busy and um, just try to reach and want to say thank you for their their contribution, because they've been a student of mine for 30 eight years, 37 years. Okay. Wow. So like, him to pass it. yeah. Yeah. So I, I do, I have gratitude for things, but most of it today as students, I mean, I could pull it up and show it to you if you want. Yeah. Pull it up. I was actually going to ask you if you could read us a recent entry to give us like insight. So here's, I had the opportunity to find out my long-term friend, student Jean died today from Alexandria, I had the opportunity to consult with Mark Petrovic in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Had the opportunity to receive a lovely letter from my student, Louise, who's thanking me and saying what, what's happened in her life since she's been doing the work. I had the opportunity to get present Beyond Criticism, a, a worldwide presentation this morning. Then I had the opportunity to um, receive a great thank you letter from Laura. So a lot of things are coming in from students on a daily basis. And then had the opportunity to receive a, a blog that I had done on love and its many forms. And it just goes on and on. There's a guy that sent me and said, look, when you're in San Diego, can you go surfing with us? And he sent me his surfboard. He says, this is the surfboard you can do. And I'm, I'm doing that. So I keep records as I travel, places I go. I just have, I do this every day. And it's just a running list, pretty Run, much? A running thing. Okay. It's a constant a constant gratitude. I mean, I just, as I go and travel the world, 
thank you letters, experiences, podcasts, webinars, yeah. books that I get to do, yeah. articles I get to write. I'm constantly, uh, that's that's an interesting one. I, I created Demartini underwear that was for Italian Vogue. I Ooh. put my name on it with John Malkovich. Oh. We sold it. We got uh, Mick Jagger to do the music for it for my promotion. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you put dates on it? Like, how do you keep track of when it all well, happens? Well, it's, it's I, I can put a date on it. Like, um, I don't always date it every day. I could easily put it in because I know exactly what date it is. Okay. But I, I don't know. I just keep it running. Okay. So, so it this is an have ongoing. Be... Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't have to be a super complex thing. It can be as simple as someone would want to make it, I would say. Yeah, here's a, here's a... Here's a guy named John DiMartino that came and sang here on the ship. And and I and, I, and everybody thought it was me with a misspelling. And they were thinking, <laughs> if he's going to play play the piano, I got to see this. And it's another guy. But I took advantage of that. We had pictures taken. Here's I was up on the balcony of the ship, and I looked out the sky, and the, here's here's the Milky Way. That's How about that? Beautiful. What a, what a night sky. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so I, I just... I have so much to be grateful for. I'm, yeah. I mean, I meet amazing people. I get to go to amazing places. And I believe that gratitude is the key to this thing. Okay. I don't miss a day. Never. Okay. There's my former girlfriend and my daughter. They're having uh, dinner together. It's time for another quick break. We're talking to human behavior expert, Dr. John Demartini. I'm your host, Brandy Fleck, and this is Human Amplified. If you'd like to see excerpts from Dr. John Demartini's personal gratitude journal, where he scrolls through a volume of pages detailing a couple weeks' worth of events and happenings that he's so grateful for, plus see other cuts we made to his interview, subscribe to The Good Seats on Human Amplified's Patreon. There, you'll receive a completely ad-free and unedited video of this interview that lasts about an hour and five minutes. Plus, you'll get behind-the-scenes commentary for this week and each week of the podcast season when new episodes come out. To get the good seats, go to patreon.com front slash human amplified. Now, back to our discussion with human behavior expert, educator, and best-selling author, Dr. John Demartini. This is just amazing. So I think that you've given us a really good example of how to do this and if someone wanted to just start gratitude journaling today, how long do you think it would take for them to start shifting their mindset? Well, there's a basic law of psychology. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day is going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. It's called Parkinson's law. And work always expands to fill the time allotted is another way of saying it. And the same thing, if you don't pay yourself first, you're going to have unexpected bills that will keep you from ever being able to pay yourself. And if you don't fill your mind with things that are grateful, it's going to fill up with things that are ungrateful. That's that simple. If you don't concentrate on how you want your life, it goes into what you don't want. And if you don't empower yourself, you're going to be overpowered by others. So there's a basic principle that if you don't take command and live by design, you're going to live by duty subordinating to external sources and, and, and uh, influences. So I'm a firm believer of taking command of your space, taking command of your time, taking command of your resources, your energy, and your material resources, and take command of what you feed your mind and read. You know, you only have so many books in your life. I've read 30,600 books. I've, I read a lot but some people don't, and there's only a finite number, and you might as well select them and think about what you want to feed your mind. Do you want to feed it escapism, or do you want to feed it something meaningful? And so I'm a firm believer that if you take the time to do something in gratitude, the more gratitude you fill your mind, the less ingratitude you're going to be dealing with. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. Yeah. Okay. What about the fear of death? I know before um, you have actually said to us, like your fear of death is your infatuation with life. But like we, like if somebody's grateful for their life and they love life, how would they combat well, fear of that, death? That's different from infatuation. Love of something is embracing both sides of it. Okay. Infatu infatuation is addiction to one side. When you got an oxytocin and you know, vasopressin rush, and you got this bonding thing of an infatuation and a dopamine fixation. That's not love. That's an infatuation with the fantasy you have about them, and you're going to feel their loss. 
You're going to be jealous. The green eyed monster is going to take over you because you're going to be frightened of losing them. When you love somebody, you see both sides. Think about somebody you've been with for a long period of time that you feel love for. You have things you like and things you dislike. Welcome to life. So if you have a real balanced view on somebody, you're more resilient because neutrality doesn't fear the loss of the positive and doesn't fear the gain of the negative. It's when you're highly polarized, you feel the loss of the positives and the gain of the negatives. Now, I've taken 4,000 people, 4,000 people through death processes, 4,000, including Kilda Ross herself. Okay. And what's, and what's interesting is these people swear there's no way I can get over this grief and this anxiety about it. I give them a money back guarantee. I can dissolve it. And the most it will take is three hours and most of them are one hour and 45 minutes to two hours. And they go, what? I did that at Kiel University and the professors, two professors that said, it's not possible. I said, watch it. And they go, they just did it in front of our eyes. I did it at... At a, at, I had three universities joined together in an amphitheater in Prince Edward Island, three psychology departments from three universities. And I did it there in front of them and they just still couldn't fathom it because the paradigm is so antiquated. The paradigm is animalistic and animals are grieving because they, they don't know how to find meaning in things. They don't know how to neutralize things. When you die, I guarantee you, the truth is you don't really want people to be grieving. You want them to get on with their life and live their life to the fullest if you care about them. And so it's really a selfish act, really. And it's an animal behavior. And it's so standard that that's the way it was. But see, I learned something different in 1976. I was down in El Salvador. And all of a sudden, I'm walking down the street. I'm down there surfing. I'm a you know surfer kid down there. And all of a sudden, a procession of 200 people, 300 people are walking down the main street. And they're celebrating and having a party and there's colorful shirts and white and stuff. And I go, Kipasa, what's happening here? Oh, our mayor died. And we're celebrating his freeing of his body into the spirit world. And I go, oh, that's interesting. That's a new perspective. So I followed him down there because I thought there's some free food. And I went down to this place <laughs> and listened to him. They were celebrating and having a party. And, the, and the, the guy was put in the ground and it was a celebration. And then I was over in Greece working with one of the the woman that was once married to the Greek dictator, and there was a death in that family, and it was two years of black covering their face, two years. I thought, death, complete polar opposite viewpoints. So that means there must be some socialization component here. It must not, it, these are two different perspectives here. And that started me on a journey to try to figure out how it was. That's a by 1984, point. by 1984, I had developed a, an absolute science guarantee to dissolve it. It, and, and, and I'm absolutely certain about it. And people, I've, I've done it on TV. I've done it in the university settings. I've done it. I mean, I did it in the Christchurch earthquake. I did it in the, Assam, the tsunami in Phuket, the tsunami in Ishinomaki, the earthquake in Japan a few years ago. I was asked to do it in the China earthquake. I'm absolutely certain about it. And people don't know it's available to them. They're just programmed by old paradigms and worldviews that are keeping them stuck. And you really want to honor somebody, love them. When you love somebody, they become present. When you're infatuated with them and they're gone, you grieve their loss. When you're resentful and they're gone, you relieve their loss. When Soleimani, the, the Iranian dictator, died, right, when uh, Trump knocked him out, five million people in uh, Iran were grieving in the streets because he was a hero there. To us in America, not to me, but to the, many of the people in America, he was a villain. He was one of the biggest terrorists. So people are celebrating and going, wow, what a relief in America over the same death. It has nothing to do with what happens on the death. It has everything to do with the perceptions you have about that individual. If they're a hero, you grieve the loss. If they're a villain, you, you relieve the loss. And so I, what I did is I figured out the neurochemistry and how the psychology works and ask some questions and liberate people from this enduring. And by the way, prolonged grief symptoms cause cardiovascular problems, digestive problems, kidney problems. It goes on skin problems. There are a lot of health concerns of prolonged grief syndrome and supporting people in their grief is actually helping them actually cause the illness in their body, but relieving it. And it's done in two hours, healing changes right down the spot. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it right there on the spot. I've actually demonstrated it. We've actually done tests on it. We've done heart rate variability. We've done things and shown the before and after in less than two hours in some cases. Okay.
So yeah, I'm I'm pretty firm about it. I people don't uh, comprehend that until they see it. They don't believe it until they see it. When they yeah. actually see it done, they go, okay, now you got my attention. Yeah. Do you have videos on your website of like some of these processes? Um, or is part this... of that is in our training pro. We we show it in our training pro. We don't do it to the general audience. Okay. Okay. We do it to the we do it to the and the training programs are facilitated. I've trained seven thousand people to do this, and they're now out there doing the same thing. They get the same results because some people say, "Well, it's just you and your." I had some psychologists in the back of the room one time when they watched this done. They said, well, is that going to last? I said, follow it up for the next year. They followed up for 18 months and found no grief at 18 months after we finished it in, 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 uh, in Japan. And the psychologist six months later said, so far, I've been no grief. Okay, you got my attention. Yeah. He decided to come to the training program to learn how to do it. Okay. Most of them are just, they don't even want to know. They got their blinders on. They don't even know that because they just, they make money off keeping people in their grief, mm. you know? Okay. I like to set them and free them up, get it over with and get on with life. I'd rather have new clients and transform their lives than same client working on the same issue for any period of time. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Where can everybody find your website and all of your interviews and all of those amazing things you have out there? You just go to drdmartini.com. D-R-D-Martini, D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And on there... You can do the value determination process to determine what's really important to you in your life because sometimes you lie to yourself without even knowing it. And you can go on the media and there are hundreds. I've done probably 10,000 interviews in my life. There's hundreds of radio, television, newspapers, magazines, podcasts, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to go learn, you're going to have to believe in reincarnation because it's going to take you four or five lives to get through it all. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, guys, well, go check out the show notes, get those links, go look at all those resources. And as always, it's been really nice talking to you today. Yes, thank you for the interview again. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and learn more at humanamplified.com. Stay motivated, relax more, and strengthen your spirituality, all to keep going in the direction of authentic, lasting healing practices in your life. Enroll today in my online mini course, Momentum Restored at humanamplified.com front slash Momentum Restored course.